So a couple of weeks back, a friend of mine sends me a couple of pictures on Facebook, uh, screenshots you see from a book that he recently found when he was cleaning out his bookshelf. You'll love it, Brandon, he said. I'll read this. It's, it's great, he said. It wasn't great. Indeed, it was anything but. Indeed, the thing that he sent me, the images that he sent, were so god-awful that I realized that I needed to get my hands on this book. So I requested that he bring it with him to the next reenactment we both attended, and, and he brought me this. This abomination of an excuse for children's education. This, this is what we in the United States are teaching our children about the origin of the nation. This book is so god awful. I, it, it's difficult to describe, but we're, that's what we're going to attempt to do in this in in this video here. It's titled "The American Revolution: A Hands-On History Book with Letters, lip, lip the Flaps, and Much More" by Innovative Kids, Hands-On Minds On. You know that the book is going to be a real wild ride when even the picture they have on the front gets the British flag wrong by, um, by, by a good couple of years. That's the 1801 flag with the cross of St. Patrick in it, uh, not the 1707 proper Union flag that the British were flying at the time. Now, this book was written by, you know what, actually, I'm, I'm not going to call out the actual names because uh, I feel like, you know, the video game may get enough views to justify that that would not be a good thing to do. It was written by uh, Douglas and Gina. Douglas and Gina, what are you doing? What, 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 what is this, Douglas and Gina? Who, I, the, now, now, I can only blame them so much. They're probably not historians. They're probably uh, more involved in children's education as a medium, as opposed to the American War of Independence. So my pedantry can only go so far with them. But, but, expert reviewed by Monica. I'm not going to say the last name again. Expert reviewed by Monica, who is a professor at Leahy University. A professor at a university. Monica, Monica. What is this? What have you done? Have you, who, who is this person? Are they an expert at all in the American War in the 18th century at all? Have, have they, let's, let's just, let's just get right into it, shall we? Let's just get right into it. We're gonna, we're gonna, now the book is filled with an awful lot of stuff, but there's one uh, set of pages in particular that I very much would like to discuss with you. You know, we, we have, it's, it's nice quality printing. You know, oh, Benjamin Franklin and the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. We have, oh, oh, the Declaration of Independence and, and the Founding Fathers and all that. But da, 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 let's go. Here we are. Here we have a lovely, see, a little portrayal of the various, of, of the two main armies that are combating in the war. We have the British soldiers on one side, and we have the Continental Army on the other side, with a description of who these people were and the equipment that they wore. Let's get started reading their description of the British foot soldier, shall we? British soldiers were provided with uniforms and supplies, yes. The American colonists nicknamed the British soldiers redcoats or lobsterbacks because their uniforms were red. Rather straightforward, but uh, yes, lobsterback, I, I believe, may have been actually a later term than the American War of Independence. Uh, that's something that I'll see if I cannot confirm and leave a note down here below. Uh, if I can't confirm the exact year that the term lobsterback came about, then I'll, I'll say that as well. But uh, that might be an anachronism. It's a small one. It's a small one. This color may have been chosen to hide the blood when soldiers were wounded. You thought that wasn't a common concern, a common complaint? Uh, no, in fact, I'm not even going to bother going into how immensely, grossly wronged, honestly, a thing like that is to say, because I have an entire video on the subject there. Go watch that one. Carrying on. Generals and other officers wore similar uniforms. On their epaulets, shoulders, the term epaulet does not mean shoulder, and epaulet is something that goes onto the shoulder. Unless I'm confusing my French there or some such, I think it's French. Uh, British, soldiers, uh, British soldiers wore gold lace ornaments to show their rank. 
overly simplistic, but yes, uh, gold lacing and silver lacing is one of the many ways in which rank may be shown. Stars and ribbons were only worn on special occasions, which I, I suppose is technically correct, although one must wonder where exactly it is relevant. We're talking about British foot soldiers. Why are we going to mention the fact that, oh, some generals may have been part of the Order of the Garter and whatnot? That's it's kind of out there to mention. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, things like stars were not like a default part of the uniform after all. Uh, British soldiers also wore long, wide sashes or cross belts that crisscrossed their chests. These sashes were often used to carry wounded soldiers off the battlefield. Okay, two things here. Well, a lot more than two. In fact, I show more than two, but that's, that's four. This is in fact four, Brandon. That's four. This is two. Uh, a few things here. First off, uh, sashes are actually very distinctive from cross belts. The sash is something that an officer or indeed uh, sergeants, certain kinds of NCOs, will wear around their waist to show that they are in fact holding some sort of rank and that they are in fact on duty. You know, that red sash around, say, an officer's uh, waist. Uh, however, the cross belts, which are not referred to as sashes in any period source, at least that I've ever seen, um, often used to carry wounded soldiers off the battlefield. I mean, Technically, you could grab a guy by his cross belt and drag him. Uh, that would not be a good idea because, you know, if the belts are like this, you grab onto the belts, they're just going to slide up unless they're, you know, held on by the epaulets. But the thing is that, you know, it being held on by the epaulette, yes, would prevent the belt from just sliding up as you pulled on them. But the thing is that the epaulets are not particularly strong bits of cloth. They're not particularly strong bits of material. The cross belts are not in any way designed to be hauling people about by them. Rather, you know, the one cross belt, the one you wear over your left shoulder, is used to carry your cartridge pouch, your cartridge box, either way. Um, difference in the terms, but uh, your cartridge pouch on your right hip, and then the other shoulder, I'm sorry, the other cross belt is going to be worn over the right shoulder, and that's going to have your bayonet scabbard on the other side, your bayonet frog is what it's referred to as. Um, they're used to carry equipment. It's not used to you know, drag wounded men off the field. Uh, rather, if you want to drag a wounded man, I'll tell you, you're going to grab him, you know, under the shoulders, which is a lot, lot sturdier than relying on this belting being held on by these thin little straps of epaulets. Um, now, that's not a good idea at all, and certainly not the intended purpose. Well, let's carry on. Unlike the Continental soldiers, British soldiers constantly trained. Um, Yes, more or less. Uh, during the early years of the war, that's not necessarily the case, as the British Army was very poor in its discipline uh, and faced many problems as a result. But later on, yes, they do get a lot better in terms of their actual drilling and discipline, etc., etc. Um, although it does say, unlike the Continental soldiers, I, I mean, you know, once Steuben comes in, the Continentals are drilling fairly regularly as well. It's, it's not like they never drilled at all. Uh, it's actually kind of a disparaging note towards the Continentals in a way. Um, but again, it, it's not the furthest from the truth. Um, British soldiers were taught to load and fire their musket rifles. Uh, to load and, fi and fire their musket rifles. Yes, that is in fact what it says, musket rifles. Uh, no, 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 a musket is a very different thing from a rifle. Uh, now, yes, you can have a rifled musket, a rifled musket, not a rifle musket, um, or not a musket rifle, rather. Um, but that's the sort of thing that's not going to be coming out until, like, the Crimean War, you know, 1800s, much later on. Um, they know nothing about the British firearms, uh, British standard issue, you know, brown best musketry at the time uh, was rifled at all, so that's completely wrong. Oh, and as if it couldn't get any worse. Let me carry on with the full sentence once more. British soldiers were taught to load and fire their musket rifles five times a minute. Five times a minute. That's a little over 10 seconds per... Wow, I mean, that's a massive upgrade because the parade standard is usually three rounds a minute. The actual battlefield performance is going to be a little less than that. If you're able to get four rounds a minute in a battlefield scenario, that is extraordinary. That is insane. That is well worthy of note. But here, here, thank you, thank you so very much to Douglas, Gina, and, and, and Monica, who have upgraded the British soldier to firing at a massive rate of five rounds every single minute, like bloody machine guns at that point. Most Continental soldiers could only load and shoot two to three times a minute. Those pesky Continentals, they're only the, you know, absolute height of the, of the two to three rounds a minute, but that's what the British Army was doing. Goodness me, heavens above. 
Uh, however, however, British soldiers did not have the same freedoms that the Continental soldiers enjoyed. Soldiers were harshly disciplined if they broke the most minor rule. Yeah, they may have been good soldiers, but they didn't have freedom like our soldiers did. Okay, a few things to unpack here as well. Um, first off, soldiers were harshly disciplined if they broke even the minor rules. Now, compared to modern day standards, most certainly the discipline was harsh. There were hangings, there were shootings, there were floggings, there was hard labor, etc., etc., etc. Compared to the standards of the 18th century, actually, the British army was surprisingly lenient in some ways. Uh, oftentimes, when there were deserters, you know, th the punishment for a deserter is intended to be death, death by hanging of the neck or something like that. Uh, but actually, it was really quite common for pardons to be given, for leniency to be shown, for uh, sentences to be reduced or even, you know, gotten rid of entirely. Uh, the British army was uh, actually, uh, it faced a little bit of criticism and there was a lot of debate going around during the 18th century that really they, they weren't being harsh enough, that they were being way too forgiving towards these sorts of infractions towards their men. Uh, that could be a whole video subject on itself, of course, the uh, discipline in the British army during this time period, but it was not necessarily so iron harsh as we make it out to be when compared with the usual standard of the 18th century and the standard that you would expect of the British army even elsewhere in the world. Now compare this as well to continental soldiers. This implies that continental soldiers were not punished in an equal fashion. Now again, were continental soldiers punished, you know, uh, very, very harshly, very, very grimly for every little infraction that they committed. Well, no, much like the British were not, the Continentals were not either. But this is not to say that Continental soldiers were not hanged or shot for, you know, uh, um, uh, desertion and things like that. Uh, you know, discipline in the Continental Army was also quite harsh. And as Joseph Plum Martin mentions in his memoirs, that the Continental Army was compelled to remain in military service under military force, under military threat, so to say. They were obliged to remain while militia forces, militiamen, could come and go as they pleased. But if, you know, if, if, if um, one of the Continental soldiers, if Mr. Um, Plum Martin were to leave without without leave, uh, and he would face very, very severe military repercussions for doing so. So that entire sentence is just warped in a very stereotypical and strange, disgusting way. A major disadvantage for the British was that their soldiers were far from home. Yes, very true. Uh, traveling for months over the sea on crowded ships, many died of disease during the voyage. Yes, that's also fair. Uh, the ships were also always in danger of sinking from hurricanes or enemy attack. Not like there's that many hurricanes, but but yes, also very true. Uh, storms in general, and actually, yeah, more you know, tropical storms and hurricanes more in the middle of the Atlantic as opposed to the big ones that we're used to hearing about on the news every couple of years. Yeah, no, actually, that that's that's pretty fair. That that is a constant risk. Um, many British soldiers had even been forced into fighting, while the Continental Army was made up entirely of volunteers battling on their own soil for their independence. One of the most distinctive aspects of the British army during this time period, unlike the continental armies of Europe, was that they were one of the only powers to not employ conscription tactics. Indeed, yes, while the British Navy was made up of a great deal many conscripts, men pressed into service, the army had exceedingly few and far between men who were not there of their own free will. You know, uh, yes, odds are, historically speaking, there were a, few, a good few men who were in there not of their own free will, either forced by some strange circumstance or, or indeed uh, pressed into service illegally. I I'm sure that sort of thing did happen, but this makes it out like it was a policy to force men into the army. Now, now, the closest you get from that is the British army drawing from militia, you know, their militia back home, uh, into the regular army, but even that was always done on a volunteer basis. 
And, and that was much more popular during the Napoleonic Wars. In fact, one of the biggest problems that the British Army faced during the American War of Independence was an absolute shortage of recruits, a shortage of manpower. So much so, indeed, that they at one point actually reduced the terms of service. The terms of service, that makes it sound like you're signing a contract on a website. Uh, they reduced the, the contract of how long you enlist um, dramatically in an attempt to get more people to enlist in the army. You know, it's usually like a lifelong service. It's like 20-something years when you join the army. But they said, All right, how about this? How about if you enlist in the, in the military, uh, it'll be for three years uh, or whenever we end the war, like whichever one comes sooner. Will, will you enlist then? Because they were so desperate to get people to actually join up because they did not have the power to force anyone to join. Uh, that is a massive dynamic in really all of British military history that they, unlike the continent, do not conscript people into their armies for better or for worse. Then meanwhile, of course, it says the Continental Army was made up entirely of volunteers battling on their own soil for their independence. It's, it's again, it's attempting to draw a, a distinction where none lies. It's portraying the British soldiers as slaves forced to fight for a tyrannical king and all these silly, silly, outdated ideals. Uh, when compared to the to the Continental soldier who's fighting independently for his freedoms uh, alongside his brothers in arms and uh, yada yada yada, you get the idea. So now, um, all right, that was an awful lot. So the British foot soldier. All right, great, good stuff. Uh, let's move on. Uh, as you can see uh, further down at the base there, we have a little picture of a Hessian soldier, in fact. Uh, it says, uh, which uh, one section says loyalist, one section says Hessian. Let, let's uh, start with the loyalist soldier, shall we? Saying uh, some colonists were, some, co some of them, were still loyal to the crown and fought alongside the British army basically true, but again, some colonists, a good many colonists, in fact. Uh, their uniforms differed from those of the Redcoats, as they were not officially members of the Royal Army. Now, that's good until that last where uh, the Royal Army... Uh, no, in fact, you'll find that the only branch of the British military uh, that is not royal is, uh, is indeed the Army. You have a Royal Navy, and of course, today you have the Royal Air Force, but the army has not been royal uh, since the English Civil War and the New Model Army and all that jazz. Uh, the army is very distinctly not royal. And then, of course, we have Hessian soldiers. Later in the war, uh, yeah, if by later you mean like almost at the outset, uh, Hessians began fighting alongside British soldiers. Hessians were German soldiers hired out by the German government uh, that is, in, I, I read that correctly, by the German government, singular, one German government, you know, Heil der im Siegerkranz, you know, Deutschland über alles, apparently uh, the German Empire has been united in 1776. Um, is indeed hired out uh, by the German government to fight for Great Britain against the colonial rebels. However, I will give them credit one thing there. It did in fact mention that the Hessians were not mercenaries, but were, were hired out, were forced in a way to fight by their states, not so much by their own free will as we usually understand the term mercenary to imply. So um, that's a bit of a credit there. Uh, just a ger uh, German soldiers hired by the, by the government singular. That's, that's a bit off. Uh, now then, instead of uh, going over now to the colonial side of things, because I realize, honestly, uh, this video has probably gone off for long enough as it is, actually. So I think we'll, we'll save the colonial infantry soldier for another time, uh, if we are so inclined. Uh, if we look over now to the, uh, the little picture of the British soldier, we can flip it open. Ah, ha, ha, and there's even more information there. We'll go over that, and then we'll talk about that god-awful picture as well. We flip open that little tab and we have aha, a wonderful little section on the British Navy. It says, at the start of the revolution, the British Royal Navy was the greatest in the world. Eh, I mean, they hadn't acquired the same, um, you know, primacy, the, the same just sheer superiority that they had in the Napoleonic Wars after 1805 and the Battle of Trafalgar. But um, I, I think you can argue, yeah, that they are probably the greatest in the world. Um, alongside the French, most certainly, they were among, if not the greatest naval power in the world. Uh, they had more than 270 large warships, each holding as many as 100 cannons. Plural of cannon is cannon. Um, at least during that time period, it's a bit more forgivable in a modern day book. But um, I'm not entirely sure where they get the number of 270 large warships. Uh, I'm also interested in how they define the term large warship. Uh, is a large warship 
a rated ship or is it anything from a frigate up is it is it is it only like a first second or third rate um i, I don't know exactly what that means there they really ought to qualify that an awful lot more although for a children's book maybe not necessarily um but the thing is um i don't i don't particularly doubt the number itself it sounds fair and fair enough but um there's no source provided in fact through the entire thing uh, there, there are no sources provided. There's a glossary in the back, but but there, there is no uh, work cited whatsoever. So there's no way uh, for an aspiring young student to track down this information and then learn more. It's only by buying this book, which is um, disingenuous and dishonest to say the least. These ships carried troops and supplies to the colonies in addition to providing firepower that could destroy colonial port cities. I mean, they could, yes, but they're not really destroying entire cities as a, on, a, on a regular basis. Now, yes, there were raids. There were um, sort of like expeditionary, expeditionary forces and raids and whatnot being launched from ships into colonial towns and port cities and whatnot uh, to attack specific supplies, you know, deprive rebels of, um, you know, timber for building ships or, or gunpowder, um, firearms, things like that. that. That did happen, but this makes it out to be like uh, they're on a regular basis. The entire fleets were just showing up outside of Brit um, sorry, American um, cities and just bombarding them, shelling them. Shelling is not a period appropriate term, but, you know, just absolutely leveling these things from the sea and then just sailing on like like pseudo Vikings or something. That's not even a thing that Vikings would do. Um, whereas that's definitely not the case. Uh, I mean, the British were trying to wage a, a, a PR war here, a, a war of public relations uh, and reputation. They're not going to be just leveling entire cities out of the blue. Um, but they could. They had the firepower. They could destroy colonial port cities if they wanted to. Uh, instead of just deploy and destroying select, you know, rebel held supplies uh, with usually land expeditions. That's beside the point. Uh, the British also had a fleet of schooners and frigates. Uh, so that implies that schooners and frigates are not being included in the 270 large warships. Uh, these were smaller ships that could stop colonial trade and be used for spying. Yeah, that's not wrong. That, that, that's correct. Uh, the British Royal Navy would have, although it would have been worthy of note that frigates could also, uh, actually I think more appropriately, defend British commercial shipping from American pirates as well. They, uh, they neglect to mention the American pirates. Uh, the Royal Navy would have completely defeated the colonists if it had not been for the Continental Privateers and later the help of the French Navy gave, oh, the help that the French Navy gave to the American cause. Of course, one must first mention the colonial privateers. They're the ones who made the real difference. Ah, and then the, the French helped us out too. The, the French helped us out too, um, ignoring particularly um, significant contributions. <clears throat> And then, of course, we have another... Oh, incidentally, yeah, there's a picture of a ship here, which, uh, again, has the wrong flag. It's a fairly common trend in this book. Uh, and then we have a uh, British Army section. It's different from the foot soldier section, I suppose. Saying, at the start of the American Revolution, the British Army was the finest in the world. A, won a wonderful, a lovely little line that is repeated ad nauseum by so many uh, so-called American academics. Uh, and yet... Where is the evidence for this in any way? Where is the citation? Where are the source materials? Where is the research? That is a very, very big term to make. They were the best army of their time. Whereas, if you look at the actual performance, the actual battlefield performance of the British Army in the early years of the American War of Independence, their levels of drill, their levels of discipline, the size, really every way that you can quantify this uh, idea, this trait of being the finest army in the world, they fall short in pretty much every category. In terms of drill, uh, you know, the French and the Prussians were better. In terms of size, the French and the Prussians were better. In terms of, uh, you know, overall capacity to wage war, again, the French and the Prussians have it. Uh, really, the French army was probably the finest in the world if you were to look at all these different factors. Uh, by what standard they measure the British army being the finest in the world, I have no idea. Again, particularly in the early years, the British army was really in quite a dismal state in terms of their discipline and everything. That they. They were very far, very far from the finest army in the world. If they were the finest in the world, well, maybe the war would have gone an awful lot differently in those early years. It had more and better weapons than the Continental Army did. It had more and better weapons. That's a very funny sentence, but it, the, the sentiment is true enough. Uh, than the Continental Army did. And this is the best, this is the best, this is what I was waiting for. This is, this is the best line. Okay, all right, wait for it. 
every British soldier, every single one of them, every British soldier, privates, corporals, sergeants, every single one of them, was given a rifle, a bayonet, yep, yep, okay, a bayonet, and two pistols. <laughs> um, no, in, in fact, you got, you got a third of it right, at least, you got one third of it right. Every British soldier was issued with a bayonet, uh, and alongside that bayonet, they had a musket, and that's it. Some light infantry men may have like tomahawks or something like that. I don't know, but but no, uh, but, but uh, two pistols. Who? Where did that idea? Again, there's no citations. I would love to see an example citation for that information. Where they got the inspiration for random British soldiers running around with two pistols, like some sort of you know 18th century Rambo or some such, uh, and then a rifle as well. It's like. No, do you know the difference? You're writing a book on the American War of Independence. You don't seem to know the difference between a rifle and a musket. That is a very big distinction to make. Heavens above, a rifle, a bayonet, even though bayonets usually weren't fixed to, to rifles, so I don't know what they're doing with a bayonet when they have a rifle, and two pistols. Why would you even need the two pistols if you have a musket? When you get in really close, you can drop the musket and then blast them like that. That's not how a bayonet charge works. That's a horrible idea. They were well clothed and well fed. <laughs> yeah, well, well fed. All right, that's, yep, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And if wounded in battle, they had the finest doctors to treat them. The finest doctors? That's not what I... No. No, no, they, they didn't. The British brought many uh, comforts of home with them. Some officers even brought their families along. Now, that, that much uh, families, yeah, it's not like they were on campaign with them. Usually they were, you know, in cities and whatnot. But yeah, no, that, 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 that's true enough. Um, some actually, some officers even brought their dogs with them on campaign. As a fun little tidbit there. Um, the British, and even some patriots, did not think the colonists had a chance against the great British army. Uh, as opposed to the reality, looking at an awful lot of those early primary sources from the, the early years of the war, there are actually an awful lot of British talking about like, ooh, you know, this is kind of a precarious situation. We might not be able to do this. And in fact, as the war progressed, a great deal of British uh, would, would go on all about how they, um, they, they ought not even be fighting the war to begin with. They were actively siding with the uh, rebels and saying that this entire cause is absolutely pointless. We should just go home, that this war is already lost. Um, although they, of course, as soldiers, were continuing to do their duty to the best of their abilities and whatnot. Ah, and then here, of course, here, of course, uh, just underneath that, uh, randomly thrown in, we have a section on Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yankee Doodle Dandy was a song that the British soldiers sang to mock the Continental soldiers. Yes, uh, and then it has in parentheses, you see, Yankee was an insulting name that the British called the colonists. No, actually. Um, Yankee is a term that if you read through something like, say, Joseph Plum Martin, you'll find numerous references to the term Yankee. You'll find, actually, that it was a common term across the uh, really all the colonies. Uh, really, the Americans and British both were referring to uh, the colonists as Yankees. Uh, although, in fact, not so much the colonists on the whole, but rather uh, explicitly, specifically indeed, to uh, New England colonists. You know, someone in New York would look up north and say, those Yankees. Someone in Pennsylvania would say, oh, those Yankees. Meanwhile, someone in Massachusetts would be like, yes, we're Yankees, no matter of pride and whatnot. Um, no, in fact, the term Yankee only really meant to mean American on the whole uh, during the course of the war, I, I think, or, or even later on, um, to those outside of the United States. Uh, and then, of course, within the United States, it began to take on a sort of an idea of it only being Northerners in general, you know, like anything north of the whatever, the Dixie Mason line or whatever, uh, during the American Civil War. But, but originally, it explicitly referred to uh, New Englanders, very specifically, and not New Yorkers. Don't include New York. New Yorkers aren't really Yankees. Which is ironic, isn't it? But in any case. Um, doo -doo -doo. The song reflected the overall opinion that Americans were ignorant and classless. Uh, for instance, the phrase, stuck a feather in his cap, refers to how soldiers were made officers in the Continental Army with little regard for social status or training. Uh, 
No, uh, actually, the, the term, at least as I understand it, I, I, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty certain that uh, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni uh, is a refer, yes, indeed, to how the colonists were ignorant and classless, but it's rather because you have some, you know, country bumpkin who is trying to be fashionable, trying to be uh, macaroni like all of the other, you know, city gen uh, gentility and whatnot. Uh, so he goes into the dance and he just puts a feather inside of his cap and says, oh, I'm fashionable now, right? Like, that's that's what you do when you want to be fashionable. You, you, you put a feather in your hat and like, I'm, I'm one of you now, right? Uh, no, in fact, uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy uh, sticking a feather in your in your cap is not enough to be macaroni, to be, um, you know, uh, fashionable and whatnot. Uh, it doesn't have anything, as far as I'm, I'm aware, it doesn't have anything to do with um, how the Continental Army was making their officers. That's very, very specific. I mean, certainly that's indicative of the wider concern, but it's not explicitly referring to officer classes. Uh, even though the song was meant to offend, the colonists enjoyed singing it. Yes, that is, that is fair enough. <sighs> All right. We're almost done, everyone. We're almost done with... With, 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 with one page of this book. You see, last of all, we are met with a wonderful, a, a lovely little diagram. You see uh, an image there, uh, oh, a picture of a British soldier. And uh, of course, thankfully, uh, wonderfully so, it labels all of the different parts of the soldier so that the young children can learn all about the uniform. Starting, of course, with the soldier's bicorn hat. Uh, indeed, it is not a bicorn. Uh, indeed, if you want to use the Victorian terminology, it would be considered a tricorn. Although, if we want to use the appropriate 18th century terminology, uh, it is in fact a cocked hat. The term tricorn does not come about until like the 1830s or something like that. Um, it is very much a later term uh, appropriate to the American War of Independence. It would be referred to as a cocked hat. Uh, so that's completely wrong. Uh, then, of course, it carries down to uh, the man's pack, uh, which is how they refer to it, a uh, goat skin. Goat skin is good. Some of them were made of goat skin. Haversack. Uh, no, indeed, the haversack is worn across the shoulder. It's used on the, usually on the left hip, and it is used to carry rations. Whereas what they are pointing to there, the soldier's pack, would be more like a, well, either a blanket roll or a formal like goatskin pack, uh, in which he may carry all of his other necessities. Um, you know, personal um, objects and all those sorts of things. It, it, it's a soldier's pack, as you'd expect. Um, the haversack is explicitly really for rations, and it's actually carried, again, around the shoulder at the hip. It is not a pack like that. The wrong term is being used. Um, then it skips down to uh, measuring out his waistcoat. I don't know why they're explicitly referring to the waistcoat in particular, but yes, in fact, the waistcoat is there. It looks like it's made of linen, which is not terribly authentic. Um, looks very wrinkly and everything. I, I don't like the look of that of that waistcoat. Um, the soldier's coat is not even buttoned at the very top, as you can see. Not buttoned, but um, pinned, you know, closed uh, with the uh, the hook and eyes uh, at the top of the coat, as it's usually done. Uh, the soldier is wearing a neck stock, which I appreciate. Uh, then it, of course, points out the soldier's cross belts, which are quite good. Um, you know, that that is the term for it, is a cross belt, not a sash. Although there's no um, belt buckle on those cross belts, which is funny enough. Um, then scrolling down, it points out the man's cartridge box, which, um, if I recall correctly, is actually a cartridge pouch, the style that he has there. It's not a box at all, but overall, still not a very big concern. Uh, the gentleman has a tin canteen. Now, the name tin canteen, that works. Yes, that is appropriate. That is what a soldier should have. Uh, but then while they label it as a tin canteen, he very explicitly has a wooden canteen at his hip. Um, bit of a uh, of a misprint there, I suppose. I'm sure British soldiers, yes, many of them did probably have wooden canteens if they lost their tin one. Uh, but you'd think that they would have at least the two terms matching there. Um, you'll also actually, if we look just a little bit above the tin, uh, sorry, the wooden, whatever, the canteen, uh, you'll note that his cross belt there, which is meant to have the bayonet scabbard, the frog, uh, does not in fact have anything attached to it. That belt is just kind of sitting there. It doesn't actually belong to anything. There's nothing attached to it. In fact, the real man's uh, bayonet sheath, as they refer to it, not the, not the worst term, it's not entirely appropriate, but bayonet sheath, scabbard, frog, um, is in fact just uh, kind of floating there on his hip. It's just kind of suspended in midair. Maybe he so, like, sewed it directly to his coat or something like that. Who knows how that's happening, but that's his bayonet sheath there. Um, Although, in fact, uh, maybe it is somehow connected through an invisible string to his waist belt. Because, yes, indeed, the soldier has a third belt that he's wearing. Again, for reasons entirely unknown. Um, you know, yes, early on in the war, soldiers did have belts 
going across their waist. Uh, those were belts. Those were the belts that were used to carry the soldiers' bayonets. However, early on in the war, soldiers stopped t using these belts around the waist because, as it turns out, it's you know, very um, constricting in terms of the breathing and whatnot to do so. They took these waist belts and they slung them over their, yes, they slung them over their shoulders, converting them, turning them into uh, shoulder belts or cross belts. Um, however, this man seems to have decided to go with both ways. He has both a waist belt and a cross belt. I, be, I guess he's just trying to be really, really fashionable, even though that waist belt serves quite literally zero purpose for him. Uh, the breeches are very, very, very much loose-fitting on the gentleman, probably, again, made of linen, which is not the best material. Um, you want more proper wool uh, sort of uh, breeches more often than not. Um, yeah, very, very loose, very ill-fitting, which I don't appreciate. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, looking further down, we have the man's stockings, which is good. Um, his gaiters are... I'm sorry, not his gaiters. His garters are probably just covered up by his breeches, which is acceptable. It usually happens with mine as well. Um, and then, of course, we have the man's splatter gaiters. <laughs> what? No, the... I do appreciate that they don't just have him wearing boots like many portrayals of this level of quality do. Um, they do portray the gators being shown, but what is a splatter gator? Like, there's something called spatter dashes, yes, which are basically just gators. It's a different term for the gators, but splatter gators? That's not... A, a, I, I guess, okay, because it... I guess theoretically would prevent things from splattering onto your stockings and uh, things do splatter on splatter gators that's not that's that's not what they're called they're called gators or or half gators or something like that depending on the length of them and everything but yeah no that's not that's not the term uh, and then of course finally at last it has flintlock musket which is which is appropriate enough uh, the sling, incidentally, the sling on that flintlock musket is um, fairly, yeah, looking at mine in the corner there, is uh, very, very short. I have to wonder why uh, it only reaches halfway up the musket when it ought to reach the entire way up there. Um, and then looking at the piece as well, it, it actually kind of looks like it may or may not actually have a, a lock on the thing, but that's neither here nor that's That's a whole other concern. Um, <sighs> all right. Is that, is that everything? Is that, um, is that everything? I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's, um, I think that's everything that I can talk about at the moment here. I'm sure there are a few other things here and there about this man's portrayal that I've missed, and, and presumably as well, the Hessian portrayal is, uh, missing a lot of things as well, but I'm less familiar with the Hessian kit, so I can't really identify anything. Um, it is worthy of note, actually, the Hessian doesn't have a bayonet either, so I'm not sure where, where that went. Um, his small clothes also look to be linen, which is not entirely appropriate, um, He's a very nasty sort of look about him, doesn't he? But otherwise, the Hessian looks decent enough, I suppose. I'm not entirely sure. But, uh, yeah. The British Foot Soldier, according to the American Revolution, uh, by uh, Douglas Gina, and expert reviewed by Monica of, uh, Leahy University. Copyright 2009 by Innovative Kids. This book costs $17. This, this book, this book retails as $17. You know what you can get for $17? You can get this for $17. You can get bloody Cuthbertson for $17. See what ha you see what you did. You see what you made me do. This is what happens. I'm done. That's it. That's the video. Go home. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you all so very much for watching. Of course, in particular, to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com. It is by virtue of your support that I am able to carry on making videos like this one. Although, heavens forbid, I'm not sure why I make myself suffer in this way. Uh, and then, of course, to you as well, my dear viewer. Thank you for suffering through all this with me. Uh, and of course, until the next time, well, I am and I shall remain, uh, perhaps not a terribly humble, but your most obedient of servants. <laughs>